start. <coughs> okay. We're running. Very good. <coughs> Come. <coughs> Om Sahana Vavatu Sahana Bhunaktu Sahavidyan Karava Vahai Tejaswina Vadhi Thomas Duma Vitwisha Vahai Om Shanti 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 Chaitanyam Sarvagam Sarvam Sarva Bhuta Guhashayam Yat Sarva Vishayati Tam Thus my Sarva Vidayamaha Oh my God So Welcome. We have a new camera over here, so every our online students can see our students here more nicely. Welcome to all of you, and of course, welcome to the many online students. Wh when I teach these classes, just uh, you might wonder, uh, addressing our local students, why do I always make a comment about our online students? Right now, there's about 20 or 30 of you in this hall. Within the next week, more than a thousand students will watch this video. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, to ignore <laughs> our <laughs> online students would not be appropriate. They're very active, very engaged, lots of comments. So very like you. They're exactly like you, dedicated students, except for the fact that they don't live within driving distance of our ashram. If they did, we couldn't, if we had a thousand students <laughs> <laughs> living within driving distance of his ashram, I don't know what, what we would do. <laughs> and fortunately, we don't have that problem to contend with. Okay, <coughs> let us, what button am I supposed to push? This one, and this one, we can continue into the next section of this uh, wonderful text of Shankara. In our prior class, Shankara was talking about how consciousness is unique when we say consciousness must be known. To know consciousness is unlike knowledge of anything else, because knowledge of anything else is knowledge of an object. You know my presence in, in this chair. I know the presence of the chair. Generally, we use the term I know to refer to objects. That language doesn't work <laughs> with Atma. When you, you can say, I can say, I know Atma, but when I use that language, I'm using it in an utterly different way than when I say, I know the chair. They're not parallel statements at all, in spite of the fact that they use the same verb, to know. In fact, this is going to be one of our topics. In fact, the main topic in the next series of verses is this. In a prior class, Shankara made it very clear and quoted some Upanishads, Kena Upanishad, to establish the fact that Atma can not be known as an object. Full stop. By the way, what does that mean for neuroscientists who are searching for the origin of consciousness. What is the implication? Neuroscientists who are searching for the source of consciousness, like they would search for neurological activities, like doctors search for different organs in our bodies and different pathogens, etc. Will those neuroscientists ever be successful in discovering objects? They're looking for an object. Will they ever be dis successful in discovering Atma, consciousness? They're looking for an object. Atma is not an object. Consciousness is not an object. But that now leads us to the question for today's class. Then how is it known? We're so 
entrained in this idea that I have to know something. I know this chair, what color is it, what shape is it, what is it made of, etc., etc. All that entire approach is completely inapplicable to knowing Atma. Then how shall Atma be known? That's what we see in this series of verses. Swarupa Vyavadhana Bhyam Swarupa Vyavadhana Bhyam Jnana Loka Swabhavataha Jnana Loka Swabhavaha Anya Jnana Napekshatvat Anya Jnana Napekshatvat Jnatam Chaiva Sadamaya Nyatam Chaiva Sadamaya. Start in the third line. Actually, fourth line. Nyatam. Atma is known. Sada. Always known. Maya. By me. Shankara uses this word me to refer to anyone. Atma is always known. And now comes known how. That's our discussion. And he says in the third line, anya, jnana, anapekshatvat. It, the, uh, before I explain that, sada, always known. Atma is always known. Did you always know this chair? Not before coming here. Any other kind of knowledge we have, that knowledge has an origin in time. Everything you know, all forms of knowledge have an origin in time, not knowledge of Atma. He says, Sadagnatam, it is always known. Why? And now we get into the uh, profound discussion here. Anyagnana adampekshatvat, knowledge of Atma doesn't depend on anya jnana, any other kind of knowledge. And that's a reference to the fact that your knowledge of the chair depends on knowledge coming from your eyes. Your knowledge of what I'm saying comes from knowledge of what you hear. So there's a dependencies involved in all other kinds of knowledge. You're dependent on some kind of tool, some kinds of means of knowledge, in including your five senses. Do you need to see Atma here? <coughs> Taste, touch, what does Atma smell <laughs> like? Pardon me for being a little, a little silly. Our five senses are useless in terms of knowing Atma. They're very useful in terms of knowing the world around us, but completely ineffective in telling us anything at all about Atma. So, Anya Jnana, Anapekshatvat. Knowledge of Atma doesn't depend on anything else, then how is it known? And here comes the very profound uh, description. In the second line, he says, it, it is uh, because, these are all hetus, they're all reasons Shankara is giving in this uh, verse. He says, jnana aloka swabhavataha. Because the nature of atma, its swabhava, its essential nature, is jnana aloka the light of knowledge. We use this light metaphor a lot. And in a, I think later in today's class, we'll talk more about the problems <laughs> associated with that metaphor, but we'll come there. So right now, just as uh, the sun illumines in the same way, in a metaphorical way, knowledge consciousness, let me say, illumines the activities of your mind. This is such a common metaphor we've used so many times. Now it gets more, more significant here. He gives two more reasons up above. So the fact that, first reason, the fact that knowledge is, <coughs> the fact that Atma is the consciousness which reveals all the activities of your mind means that that consciousness is a very fundamental reality 
Other things are known because of consciousness. Consci this is tricky. Other things are known because of consciousness. Consciousness is known because of... Oops. <laughs> that's my point. And that's what he says here. He gives two more reasons. It is the very swarupa of consciousness. No, hmm. We have to play with language a little bit. Knownness. I don't know, better, uh, I'm looking for a better word than this. This chair could be said to have the quality of knownness. Seeing me in this chair, I have the quality of knownness. And consciousness is knownness. Consciousness is the knownness of the chair. Consciousness is the knownness of my body. Consciousness is the knownness of every activity that takes place in your mind. And he gives one more very <laughs> important observation here. Avyavadhana, that bhyam is a dual termination, causal. Avyavadhana um, means it is not distant. It is not proximate. It's immediately present. And this brings us to the kind of language we've used in this class many, many times before. And that is, Consciousness is immediately present here and now, note these words, as the knownness of this experience. Consciousness is present here and now as the knownness of this experience. These words are chosen very carefully. This experience you're having right now, whatever you're experiencing, has two components. One is whatever you're experiencing. Second is the knownness of the experience. Can you have an unknown experience? Does that make any sense at all? By definition, all experience contains the object known and what we're calling knownness. This knownness is a kind of philosophical term used to describe consciousness. So because consciousness is itself knownness, you don't need to know it. It's already present in your experience, here and now, making everything else known. And earlier I said that all other kind of knowledges have a beginning. You came to know this chair when you walked in this room. When did you know that you were conscious? <laughs> now, this language is, is tricky. When did you know that I am, a, I am a, an intelligent human being? Of course, you have to grow up a little bit to know that. But tell me, is an infant conscious of its environment? Arguably, before being born. There's consciousness. How much? I don't what conscious of what? I don't know. But there's some kind of conscious. When did that consciousness begin? Now, you might be tempted to say, oh, Swamiji, it, it began at conception. Well, are you saying that consciousness was created at conception? We've had this discussion many times before, how consciousness as a fundamental reality is not created at conception or at any other time, but rather that consciousness is a fundamental, fundamental reality, eternal, uncreated, and therefore we understand conception as the, the embryo is and I get, probably get all the, I shouldn't use medical <laughs> terms because I always get them, get them mixed up. You are born, you, as a body, mind, entity, as a human being, you are born into already present consciousness. Consciousness was already present, and then you came along. When you came along, your mind immediately was blessed 
by that consciousness. Um, there are two words I'd like to share. I, you know, some Sanskrit terms are really, really helpful. Let me go to the uh, board and just share with you these two terms, which will help understand this. I'll, I'll just use Roman letters. And the two words are, <laughs> look at this, I said Roman letters, and I start right. <laughs> I'm too fixated on that, okay. What am I looking for? <coughs> this is my hand. These two words, yes. Swata Siddha and Swa Prakasha. These two words. Let's start here. Swa Prakasha. Self shining, literally, self revealing. We're going to be using that word quite a bit. So, self revealing means you know the chair because of your sight and consciousness. How do you know that you can see? <laughs> and we're backing up a step. You know the chair because you can see it. How do you know that you can see? Because whatever your faculty of sight brings in is in your mind. You are aware then of anything happening in your mind. But now go back one step. Three steps now, right? You know this chair sequentially. Sight, mind, consciousness. How do you know your mind? Now, you don't care, you can close your eyes, you still know what's going on in your mind. So now we only have two steps. Mind, consciousness. Third, how do you know that you're conscious? One step. Swa prakasha. Consciousness is, is self shining, self revealing, and swata siddha, self established. It, it doesn't need to, and this is a topic that will come <coughs> in the next several verses, doesn't need to be proved. I think, thank you. Thank you. Excellent. I keep forgetting to do this, and then it's uh, ver not very helpful for our online students. And going forward, if you ever see me doing that, bring it to my attention quickly. Thank you. <coughs> um, sorry, just dropped my, my line of thought. <coughs> so, consciousness is what the siddha it doesn't need to be established by anything else, it is self, literally, this means self-established. If I ask you to prove that you are conscious, what would you do? <laughs> that, you know, you say, well, because I can do willful motion. Well, you can program a robot to do that, and it doesn't <laughs> mean much. It's very significant that you can't really prove anything about consciousness. Again, it's a fundamental reality. These proofs and logic and reason that we use work very well for worldly matters, but really fall short when it comes to consciousness. Okay, this topic continues in the next two verses. Let us continue. Nanye na jyoti shakaryam, Nanye na jyoti shakaryam, Ravir hatma prakashane, Ravir hatma prakashane, Sobhoda nanya bodhe cha, Sobhoda nanya bodhe cha, Bodhasyatma prakashane, Bodhasyatma Prakashani. Here Shankara gives one of our commonly used metaphors in the second line, Ravehi, for the sun, Ravi being one of the many names for sun, Ravehi, Atma Prakashane. Since the sun is, Atma here just means self. Atma Prakasha means self-shining, like this word, Oh, Svaprakasha, 
Atma Prakasha have exactly the same meaning here. So the sun is self shining. The idea and what do you mean by self shining in the first line? Na anyena jyoti shakaryam. Na karyam. There is no need for anya jyoti for another light. If 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 I ask you, please find out if the sun is shining or not. Do you go outside with a flashlight, torch? <laughs> <laughs> you look around for the sun, no other light. And that's, un that's the unique quality of a source of light. Not just the sun, but any source of light doesn't require another source of light to be known. Why? Sva prakasha. Here, atma prakasha. It is self-shining, self-revealing. And this metaphor then is used to describe Atma, just like the sun requires no other source of light to be known, in the same way, in the final way, final line here, bodhasya, be careful here, bodha doesn't mean knowledge, it means consciousness. Sometimes uh, students get hung up on the meaning of words. Well, words have many different meanings in many different co contexts. We have to be flexible. Don't be s stuck. Consciousness is chit. Then what is chaitanyam? <laughs> then what is bodha? Then what is nyapti? What is jnanam? These words can have different meanings. Absolutely. They can also mean the same thing. Depends on context. As you've heard me say many times, the meaning of any and all words is contextual. Here, bodha means consciousness. So, bodhasya atma prakashane, and in the same way, just as the sun requires no other source of illumination to be known, in the same way, bodhasya for consciousness, atma prakashane, since consciousness is self shining, self revealing, so prakasha, therefore, so bodhana anya bodha echa. Uh, so bodhat, we have to break that properly. So, so bodhat anya, other than its own consciousness, na anya bodha echa. There is no need for any other consciousness to know the consciousness present in your experience. When you, the, the people like to play with this. Can you be conscious of your consciousness? And this, this you can play with this endlessly, but it's not helpful if you really understand it properly. Can you be conscious of your consciousness? And uh, the, meta the example that's often given, they'll say yes, and the argument goes like this. In the morning, my consciousness seems dull. After a cup of coffee or tea, my consciousness shines brightly. That's a pretty common experience, at least for me it is. <laughs> so, do you see the defect in that? Example, when you wake up first thing in the morning, how do you know you feel dull? After your cup of coffee, how do you know you feel bright? <laughs> so that dullness and brightness you're referring to are conditions of the mind, clearly, and not conditions of Atma. Atma doesn't have degree, this is what we're going to talk later about, Problems with metaphors. The sun shines really bright. How bright does a light bulb shine? It depends on how many watts <laughs> the light is. <laughs> and there are different, different wattages of lights. There are different sizes of lights. There are different ways of measuring the intensity of light. Does the intensity of consciousness ever change? Is there a brighter consciousness or a duller consciousness? We just discussed that. So just to make the point very clear, 
that the consciousness we're talking about is not like a light in all manners. There's, there are problems, limitations with that metaphor. We'll come to that shortly. Okay, let me keep moving on because there's some more material to get to. Yeah, we're done there. Natasyaivanya topeksha. Natasyaivanya topeksha. Swarupam yasya yad bhavet. Swarupam yasya yad bhavet. Prakashantara drishyo na. Prakashantara drishyo na. Prakasho hyasti kashchana. Prakasho hyasti na. Tasya, the second word for consciousness. Na anyaha apeksha. Nothing else is needed to know you are conscious. There's no you. I, I'm just I'm pausing because you think of a patient in a hospital. There are various ways that a doctor will examine the, if the if the patient seems unresponsive. They actually have levels of consciousness. They have a chart, and they have different ways of determining the levels of consciousness. How would you determine the level of your consciousness? doesn't make sense, and that's my point. Consciousness has no levels, which means you don't examine consciousness. Consci your consciousness is not subject to examination by a doctor <laughs> or even by you, the willful person, which is to say your mind cannot analyze. You can think about consciousness. What is consciousness? What are its qualities? Why doesn't it have any qualities? Why doesn't it get brighter or dull? You can, th you can think and analyze consciousness, but as a concept. When you say, does consciousness get bright or dull, we're having a conceptual conversation, analytical conversation. But in terms of your experience, Consciousness just is. And that's really the focal point of our discussion here. So he's, Shankara says here, par, first half restates what was said in the, second, in the prior verse. He says, tasya for consciousness, na anyaha, anyataha, uh, peksha, because nothing else is needed to reveal that consciousness. Why? That consciousness, yasya for that consciousness, sarupam bhavet, its very nature is conscious. I used the term before, knownness. That knownness of this experience. What a nice definition. I do, it's not commonly used. In fact, knownness as, if you tr look it up in a dictionary, <laughs> I made it up because, it, because it's very useful. So the knownness of this experience is consciousness. Now, that's restating what was said in a prior verse. You don't need to know knownness. It is self-revealing. He makes a slightly different point in the second half. Prakashantara drishyaha na prakashaha. Yasti kashchana. Na kashchana prakashaha. No consciousness is prakashantara drishya. Can be known by another consciousness. This is a subtly different point. Prior line said that your consciousness, I'll use the word your figuratively, consciousness is self revealing. That's point one. And point two is even if you try, okay, separate these two things. Consciousness is self-revealing. That's what we've been talking about so far. With your consciousness, can you identify the presence of my consciousness? 
with your consciousness, what can you tell me about my consciousness? Can you tell if it's dull or bright? Well, as you said, that's not consciousness at all. Those are conditions of the mind. In fact, with your consciousness, you can know something about my body, mind, function of my senses, etc. But with your consciousness, what can you know about my consciousness? It doesn't work like that. Hopefully some of you are thinking in the back of your mind, well, wait a minute, isn't there just one consciousness? But this is not our discussion right now, but certainly makes sense to make that connection. If there is one consciousness, does it make any sense that your consciousness should know something about my consciousness? Your consciousness is like space in a pot. My consciousness is like space in another pot. They're all one, there's one space. There is one consciousness. That's not our topic right now, so we won't go on further about it. But we now land. Did you ever jump and land in a puddle of mud? This is absolutely unrelated. And my point is we're about to land on this next verse, which is a difficult topic. And and when I say you jump and you land in something which is messy, tell you a funny anecdote. When I was a kid, there was, a, I think, a new houses were being b built in our, in our uh, suburb. And mother said, don't go to those construction sites. So what does this little boy do? Obviously, if mother says don't do it, <laughs> often do. And, and the reason is, is it's hazardous, especially for little children. I might have been seven or eight at the time, I don't know. So as I'm walking through this construction site, I, I'm wearing tennis shoes or something, and I step on a nail, a nail that's protruding from a board. So I step on the nail, and I jump. I jump up, and with my other foot, I land on the same nail. <laughs> Honestly, this happened. This is an utterly unrelated anecdote to illustrate how we're jumping into something difficult right now <laughs> with, <laughs> with, this, with this next verse. Let's go. Vyaktasya da prakashasya Vyaktasya da prakashasya Prakashatma samagamat Prakashatma samagamat Prakashas twarka karyasyat, prakashas twarka karyasyat, iti mityava chohyataha, iti mityava chohyataha. And here Shankara is going to, when I said difficulty, difficulty is logic. You used that, you saw that word. Uh, no, this is not coming. The, in, in, uh, in Vedanta, we often use the word tarka for logic. We can use other words as well. Um, and that tarka can be a little challenging because that's not, hmm, most of us aren't trained in it. I should mention that you know, traditional students, oh, you've not, maybe not considered this. In ancient times, if you wanted to study Advaita Vedanta under a, under a great teacher, you had to study everything else first, including Nyaya, Vaisheshika, Sankhya, Yoga. Nyaya means logic. So it was considered a prerequisite in the old days. Today it's not reasonable, but in the old days, was required. I still remember a good example of this. When I was uh, in my 20s, I had uh, taken to the study of Spanish classical guitar. I approached a really big shot teacher and he told me to go away and study scales for six months. <laughs> this is a kind of prerequisite that's required for, for the study. So here Shankara presumes that you have already had the study of Tarka, logic, and I'll do my best <laughs> to, 
to, uh, to make it painless, as they say. We don't have to go that deep into all of it, but we're going to see some of it. So let's, let's uh, continue. That's the difficulty we are about to face in this next series of verses. So he begins here. Vyakta Svyat. An object is revealed. Vyakta, revealed. Vyaktihi, that which is revealed. Aprakashasya, for that which is that which is not self shining gets revealed like this chair like this body this chair doesn't shine in the dark this body doesn't shine in the dark so this is what he says in the first line that aprakashasya for something that is not self shining vyakta syat it becomes evident how prakasha atma samagamat due to samagana gamat due to its connection to prakasha atma to something which is atma here by nature to something whose nature is shining so this chair and this body don't shine on their own but due to the presence of light they become known Prakashaha, oh, here, and here's the point. <sighs> Prakashaha, arka karyaha syat. This leads us to the conclusion, a wrong conclusion, that that light makes this chair and my body shine. And in a manner of speaking, they do. They reflect light. Iti, and that, sound, that sounds reasonable, right? And we've used this kind of language. That light reveals this body and chair because the body and chair reflect light. And by reflecting light, they become known. That sounds reasonable on the surface, but now Shankara is going to throw some logic at us. He says, iti, thus, this Vachaha, this kind of statement is mitya, false. This is not the right way of thinking about it. Ataha, he ataha, because of what he's already said and what he is about to say. Now, let me give you a little bit of the backstory here. <sighs> when we say, Atma is the source of consciousness. Actually, I'm thinking how to approach this. I think what we're <coughs> going to do is let me give you the essence of this topic with this verse. Then next week we'll start with this verse and then move, move forward. If we try to move on to into next verses, by the way, just to see what we're in for, look at the next verse. If X didn't exist before and then arises from Y, oh my gosh. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I think, um, <laughs> I think, why don't we hold off on that <coughs> and uh, get ourselves prepared here. Let, here are some of the issues. When we say, Atma is a source of consciousness. It's a statement that's often used. On the surface, it's okay. On examination, it's wrong. And that's what Shankara is saying here. This vachaha mitya. <laughs> These statements are false on deep examination. So why is it wrong to say that Atma is the source of consciousness. On a surface level, absolutely okay. But on deep examination, Shankara himself says, Mitya. It's not correct. So how can we understand it? Well, we understand it by the analogy to a light, which is a defective <laughs> metaphor. We keep saying Atma shines, Atma shines, Atma illumines the activities of your mind. Like there's a light bulb inside shining. 
illumining. It's a metaphor, as we've discussed before, and every metaphor has limitations. There are several limitations, problems with the metaphor of light. Um, when I say limitations, I'm not suggesting we should throw out the metaphor. They're helpful, but we should use them knowing their limitations. For example, a, a hammer is a powerful tool, but it has limitations. If you want to drive a giant uh, piece of piling, they call it, deep into the ground to form the foundation for a building with your little hammer, <laughs> you can bang on it, it's not going to work. The hammer is effective, but it has limitations. So you throw out the hammer, well, wait a minute, you use it for so many other tasks. My point is, is that metaphors are like tools. We should use them recognizing their limitations. To compare consciousness to light is useful but has its limitations. And the limitations are, come from several sources. One is in modern times, most of us know very well that light is photons buzzing <laughs> around. <laughs> the, uh, the, the, this light, by the, by the way, it's more complicated. Oh, I, I'm, I don't wanna get into this. This is an LED light bulb. For LEDs to create light requires, to explain how LEDs create light, requires knowledge of quantum physics. <laughs> how is that? <laughs> you think LEDs are ordinary. The old-fashioned uh, tungsten filament bulbs are much easier to understand. Not these, these. And how an LED creates light is fantastically complex. And the outcome of this quantum effects that take place in a semiconductor junction that cre creates photons that go zipping out of that out of that light bulb those photons bounce off my body and those photons strike your eyes they're focused by the lens on the retina and the rest we won't even talk about so this is our idea of light was that the idea of light in ancient times <laughs> Absolutely not. So the first problem is that we have this very physicalist idea about light. And if we try to apply that to consciousness, we're in big trouble. Secondly, and maybe more significantly, is a language-based problem. Um, to reveal to shine sorry i'm going to bore you with well, not bore you we have to look at it a little bit of grammar remember things such as transitive verbs and intransitive verbs transitive verbs take objects shine and illumine are transitive verbs right you shine on something. You illumine something. Light illumines something. That transitive nature of these verbs is another obstacle. By the way, the Sanskrit verbs have this exactly the same problem. Same problem, we use transitive verbs in English, we use similar transitive verbs in in uh, Sanskrit. So what is the point we're leading up to so that we can handle <laughs> this logic in our next class? When I said light is not a, I'm sorry, uh, let's go, go back to the sun. Uh, I said consciousness, um, get the language right, Atma is not the source of consciousness. Now, we have to give up the idea of this light bulb as a source of light. There's our modern mechanistic idea. Let's use the sun, try to get into this ancient worldview. We say that the sun is a source of light. Now, again, give up your Western mechanistic view. We know how the sun produces light. It's 
By the way, it's, all, it's as complicated as that light bulb, maybe more so, how the sun produces light fusion, incredibly complicated stuff. By the way, do you know that when light is created inside the sun, it takes years for that light to escape from the ball of the sun. It bounces around inside for years before, <laughs> before it gets emitted. I'm just suggesting the complexity of, of, reality, of modern scientific uh, knowledge. Set it aside. Sun is a source of light. Sounds good at first until you realize that does it, the sun, again, ancient world view, it's not that the sun produces light, which is our mechanistic view. The sun is light. Look at those two views. The sun produces light this is mechanistic. That's conventional. But now shift to this ancient world view. The sun is an embodiment of light. If you want to understand how the ancients used this metaphor, that's how they used it. The sun does not produce light. The sun is an embodiment of light. Fire, uh, actually, let me not confuse the matter. So, looking at it as such, if the sun is an embodiment of light, then it doesn't make sense to say that the sun produces light. It is light. It just shines. And here, I help me out here. Is there, you know, we can use, actually, I, I answer my own question. The word shine, English verb, shine, to shine, can be used intransitively. When you say the sentence, the sun shines. That is an intransitive use of the verb to shine. It can also be used transitively. The sun shines on the earth. That's a transitive usage, but let's use it intransitively. The sun just shines. That's the usage in ancient times. The sun does not produce light. The sun just shines. Now, with this in mind, let's go back to our... This is the metaphor, the drishtanta. Now, let's go... I'm sorry, the... the, the yeah. The, let's go back now to the darshtanta. Darshtanta is that which is meant to be explained through a metaphor. So, sun is the drishtanta, and Atma here is the Darshtanta. So just like the sun doesn't produce light, the sun is light. Now you can see where we're going. Atma doesn't produce consciousness. It's really important. Atma doesn't produce consciousness. Atma is consciousness. And the reason this is such a big deal, we're not splitting hairs. I mean, some people <laughs> may think this is hair splitting, but it turns out to be quite significant. For, the, for this LED to produce light, for the sun to produce light, there's a lot of complex mechanisms that have to go on, complex actions that have to take place. Actions at a subatomic level. In fact, even in the case of the sun, actions at a subatomic sub level create, create light. Look where we're going with this. If Atma produces consciousness, that means Atma does something. It has to work really hard to shine. I have to work, Atma has to work hard to reveal all the activities of our minds. It's an action. And this is the wrong view I'm giving, that Atma undergoes effort and performs the action of creating knownness. And this is absolutely wrong. 
Atma is Svaprakasha. It just shines. It doesn't do anything. And, and this shows very clearly the limitations of our metaphor. So to shine, if the sun shines, it's not difficult to interpret that as an action. And if you interpret it as an action, you have shown the defect of that metaphor. So we can say, Atma illumines the activities of your mind, but not by performing an action. Atma doesn't produce consciousness. Atma doesn't, we, we speak of Sakshi. Sakshi, and that word Sakshi is, is quite helpful, quite important. What does Sakshi do? Sakshi means witness. What does a witness do? By definition, nothing. <laughs> An uninvolved observer. If the Sakshi gets involved, think about on a, a, a typical case, some crime is being committed. If, if the Sakshi, the observer of that crime, gets involved, tries to stop the uh, whatever it is, the crime or something, then that person is no longer Sakshi. That person is now a participant. Consciousness is Sakshi, meaning it just shines without being involved. Our mental activities are really complicated. Atma, Atma doesn't get involved, just reveals whatever is present in your mind. The knownness of the activities of your mind is consciousness. I'd say that one more time and then we'll conclude our class for today. The knownness of any experience. Right now as we're sitting in this class, the knownness of this experience is consciousness. The knownness of whatever is happening in your mind right now is consciousness. And that word knownness allows us to avoid this idea of action, producing light, producing consciousness. There's no, Atma doesn't produce consciousness. Atma as Sakshi is self-shining and because of that self, self-shining, by the way notice we can't use the word self-conscious <laughs> because in English it has a completely <laughs> different meaning. We can use it in Sanskrit, <laughs> we can't use that term in English. Anyway, so that no, the use of this word knownness will help us avoid this wrong idea. Atma does not produce consciousness. Atma is consciousness. Now, with this understanding, we'll, we'll conclude now. We'll return to the same verse, which we haven't finished. And then we'll be able to see this and understand Shankara's logic in this verse and the uh, next couple of verses. Okay. <coughs> Om Sarve Bhavantu Sukhinaha Sarve Santu Niramayaha Sarve Bhadrani Pashyantu Ma Kaschadukha Bhagavet Asatoma Sadgamaya Tamasoma Jyotir Gamaya Mrityorma Amritangamaya Om Shanti 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 Om Tat Sat oh.